Hi, this is Mark Bircher, and this is a quick revision of Macbeth, Act 5, Scene 1, the sleepwalking scene. When the gentlewoman says, since his majesty went into the field, we presume that Macbeth has left the castle to enter the field of battle, presumably also to deal with the Scottish rebellion. So Shakespeare's presenting Lady Macbeth as a lonely and isolated character who's now suffering for her crimes. The scene's clearly focused on the motif of sleep, illustrating guilt. Lady Macbeth's behaving unnaturally as a result of the unnatural act that she committed against Duncan. And the Doctor refers to this as a great perturbation in nature, a disturbance in nature. And as we saw in the disturbance of the great chain of being, this is, on a more microcosmic level, disturbing Lady Macbeth. She has been turned unnatural as a result of the unnatural behaviour. It's interesting that Lady Macbeth enters the stage bearing a candle. The gentlewoman explains that she has light by her continually, tis her command. And this is a huge contrast because Lady Macbeth seems to now be terrified of the dark. And the contrast sits with Act 1, Scene 5, where she also issued a command through the imperative come thick night. Uh, then she wished to be surrounded by darkness, now she wishes to dispel the darkness, revealing the profound change in her character. Lady Macbeth's sleepwalking and both the Doctor and Gentlewoman employ language that together forms an antithetical parallelism. Her eyes are open, their sense is shut. And that can draw the audience's attention to the contrast between the action in the reality of the past that Lady Macbeth is dreaming about and the action in the dreamlike state that she's conducting now, the washing of her hands, etc. Also, it creates a kind of tension because we have this sense of antithesis there, things being slightly wrong, just as there's a clear wrongness in the behaviour of Lady Macbeth since she's been instrumental in conducting regicide. The Doctor remarks on how Lady Macbeth rubs her hands and this action echoes that of Act 2, Scene 2, reminding the audience of the nature of Lady Macbeth's guilt, because the last time we saw this kind of rubbing of the hands was both when Lady Macbeth washed her hands, saying a little water clears us of this deed, in contrast to Macbeth washing his hands and saying that uh, all great Neptune's ocean wouldn't wash his hands clean, essentially. We can tell that despite her words in Act 2, Scene 2, a little water has not cleared Lady Macbeth of this deed. This deed haunts her still, um, plagues her subconscious. The guilt is profound. Again, we see this in her phrase, out damn spot, out I say. There's an inability to remove that spot of blood, which again is contrasting with a little water clears of this deed. It may be a little spot physically, but in terms of its symbolic significance as representing the regicide of Duncan, it's impossible to remove. That's a stain that cannot be cleared. She then moves into um, one, two, why then it is time to do it. She's reliving the night of Duncan's murder, and that enumeration, one, two, could be linking to the ringing of the bells on the night of the murder. Uh, remember in Act 2, Scene 1, we heard, the bell invites me. Guilt is writ large in this whole sequence. Um, Lady Macbeth moves from, yet who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? A recognition of the distinct link between the blood on her hands, the spot, and the murder of Duncan. But then she shifts to the Fane of Fife had a wife, a reference to Macduff's wife. You get this kind of temporal dislocation as her mind jumps from one event to the next. And the clear link between these different times, these different actions, is her guilt. Whether it's a kind of literal guilt in terms of her actions in relation to the murder of Duncan, or guilt by association. She may be recognising that she placed Macbeth on the path that took him to the murder of Macduff's family and to the murder of Banquo. Um, she shifts from the Fane of Fife had a wife to no more of that. You mar all with this starting. An echo of the banquet scene and therefore the murder of Banquo. So once again you've got this sense of Lady Macbeth being riddled with guilt. Given that Lady Macbeth is haunted by the smell of blood on her hands, she considers the idea of being able to sweeten it, being able to essentially cover up the smell through the use of perfume. It's worth recognising that Arabia was the source of perfumes in the Jacobean period, and therefore all the perfumes of Arabia being unable to sweeten her little hand uh, provides a hyperbolic contrast uh, between that huge amount of perfume and the little hand with the spot of blood. So we get a real sense of the extent of her guilt through that um, hyperbole. 
and that parallels the hyperbolic reference to all great Neptune's ocean used by Macbeth in Act 2, Scene 2. So we've got this direct comparison here between Act 5, Scene 1 and Act 2, Scene 2, both in terms of the parallel between the guilt exhibited by Lady Macbeth and Macbeth in that those hyperbolic comparisons, and also so through the rejection of the idea proposed by Lady Macbeth in Act 2, Scene 2, a little water clears us of this deed. Clearly, a huge amount of perfume cannot disguise the smell of blood, so this is a complete rejection of the idea that a little water could dispel it. If we look at uh, Lady Macbeth's next utterance, it's full of imperatives. Wash your hands, put on your nightgown, look not so pale. Um, and also she's I tell you again, Banquo's buried. So this could be evidence of, again, her guilt. Uh, the repeated use of those imperatives presents the idea that Lady Macbeth realizes her guilt and recognizes her guilt because she has ordered Macbeth's actions. She's the one that's issued these imperatives, and that's the source of her guilt. When Lady Macbeth says here, what's done cannot be undone, we have another important comparison to an earlier scene of the play. If we compare it to Act 3, Scene 2, um, she says, what's done is done. So in Act 3, Lady Macbeth was advising Macbeth to forget the past, yet, ironically, she's now plagued by the past. Um, in Act 3, there was a kind of dismissive tone. That's in stark contrast to the regret that we see here. What's done cannot be undone, despite wishing it to be undone. That's what's implicit here. And we have a final intertextual link in the Doctor's reference to unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. It's an echo of Act 2, Scene 4. Tis unnatural, even like the deed that's done. So you've got the words unnatural and deed juxtaposed here, just as they were in Act 2, Scene 4. Shakespeare's provided, essentially, a structural reminder of the foul whisperings of Ross and the Old Man in Act 2, Scene 4, concerning the unnatural events following Duncan's murder. Um, this is clearly an allusion to Duncan's murder, but now the unnatural deeds have been seen to return to plague the inventor, as Macbeth put it in Act 1, Scene 7. Lady Macbeth is troubled by those unnatural deeds. Her brain is disturbed because of the deed that's done. Okay, tough.